Awesome. So we'll see more people uh, trickle in, but um, I want to welcome everyone to the webinar hosted by All Voices um, about how candidates and companies can thoughtfully measure their commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and how you know really we can understand more about tactical ways that companies can improve and how candidates can evaluate um, a company's commitment to DEI. Uh, the webinar is co-hosted by All Voices and Single Sprout. I'm the co-founder of Single Sprout. My name is Natan Fisher. Single Sprout is a tech-powered uh, recruiting firm focusing on growing all kinds of technology and legal teams um, that are solving some of the world's most challenging problems. To give you some context on All Voices, All Voices is an always-on employee listening tool used to ensure a culture of trust, inclusion, and transparency at companies around the world. I'm going to pass it to our panelists, starting with Diana, Dalen, Julie, and Matthew, for a little bit more about each of them. Um, but I just want to start off and say, you know, I'm so grateful to be here, so grateful to be learning, uh, trying to take away tactical benefits from each of you. You all have a great background and understanding and, and something to add here. And I really encourage everyone to, to listen in to these folks as as we learn, and I'm, I'm going to be the first student here asking you a lot of questions because myself, my company, the companies we work with, uh, this is incredibly important to us and something we all can learn more about. So passing it to you, Diana. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me. I'm Diana Scales. I use she, her pronouns, and I lead diversity, inclusion, and belonging, as well as learning and development at BuzzFeed. Um, I also have a background in recruiting and early career programs. And so this conversation today is right up my alley and I'm excited to be here. Thanks, Diana. Moving to Dalen. Hi folks, my name is Daylin Moyer. My pronouns are she and her. Uh, I'm a software engineering manager currently at driveway.com um, where I work really hard to build uh, human-centered teams, uh, high-performing human-centered teams where people can bring their full selves to work. Um, as a hiring manager, I spend a lot of time um, on the other side of this conversation, trying to convince people why they should believe in my, com my employer's commitment to DE&I or why they might question it. Thanks, Salen. Julie? Hi, I'm Julie Paik. Uh, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a software engineer at We Therapeutics or We Health. Um, I am actually, I just started a recent job with We, and I'm excited to share part of uh, my journey as I was looking for a company that is really invested and passionate about diversity and inclusion. Thanks, Julie. Thanks for joining us, sharing your point of view. Matthew. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Matthew French. I go by he, they pronouns. Uh, I identify as a gender fluid, rural, aka I'm from the country, the mountains, um, gay uh, male. I am currently the assistant director for employer partnerships and diversity strategies at UNC Charlotte in Charlotte, North Carolina. So I help employers get their diversity stuff together when it comes to recruitment. Um, and I'm also the founder of Awesomely Authentic, a 90s nostalgic branding type of company that really focuses on LGBTQ plus people and underrepresented minorities across industries and how companies can be more inclusive of those uh, identities. Thanks y'all for having me today. Thanks, Matthew. Thanks, Julie. Thanks, Dalen. Thanks, Diana. You all have uh, so much great experience, uh, unique outlooks, and I'm so looking forward to hearing from each of you. So um, I wanted to start us off um, and each of you, you know, we have questions we want to go over. We'll be monitoring on the side as well, but we'll save some time for Q&A. And um, I'll start us off with the first question, which is about candidate experience. One of the reasons I think so many people signed up for this event. What can candidates ask during the interview process to ensure their potential employers are prioritizing diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging? Um, 
We'll start up with uh, with Dylan. Your thoughts there? Well, I think there are a variety of different things you can ask, and I think you want to tailor those questions specifically to the person that you're talking to and their role and experience within the organization. If you're an individual contributor and you're talking to individual contributors, some great questions you can ask are, tell me about the makeup of your team. Uh, tell me about how the company talks to you about DEI and B. Tell me about how the company uh, brings into action that talk. And do you feel like the company's actions support their words around DEI and B? If you're talking to a manager or a hiring manager or someone in middle management, you might ask them about the executive team. Tell me a bit, a bit about how the executive team is made up and how they talk about DEI. Um, tell me about how the executive team reflects the values that they espouse around diversity, equity, and inclusion. You can leave your language sort of vague in a way that will allow your quest, your questionee to reflect some of their own biases and interpretations uh, in, in how they choose to answer your question, right? So rather than specifically asking like, are there more than just white people on the team, you can ask really sort of vaguer questions around, tell me about how, tell me about the structure of the team and the, stru the, the, the makeup of the team. How they answer that question is gonna tell you something about how they think about these things. If you're talking to someone in HR or in people ops, some great questions you can ask are, you can get much more targeted with these people because these are the folks who are really boots on the ground working to in, hopefully boots on the ground working to increase diversity within the company. So you can ask them about like, where do you feel the company is in their DEI and journey right now? And where are the gaps and the deltas between where you are right now and where you want the company to be? What are your strategies and tactics for addressing those deltas? How can I partner with you to get that work done? Are you open to partnering with me to get that work done? So as you, as you work your way through the interview panel, the fact is that everybody you speak to is going to have some perspective on their company's relationship to DEI and B. That perspective might be, I don't care, and that perspective might be, this is deeply important to me and here are the things I have to say about it, or somewhere in the middle. But you'll have a, an opportunity to have this conversation with every single person on your panel. And I encourage you to take that opportunity, understanding that each person is gonna have their own unique perspective based on where they are in the hierarchy and where they fit in on their team. But those are some things that come to mind for me about how to really leverage that opportunity that an interview is. Yeah, I love that. The makeup of your team, bringing in uh, action, everyone having a different opinion and evaluating each person's opinion and obviously bringing that together. Thanks for sharing that, Dalen. Uh, Julie, who was just in the process, uh, what questions did you have that helped you make your decision? I tried to, I was like pretty direct. I would ask them um, like what what initiatives or what groups do you have in place to make sure that um, you guys are not just hiring diversely, but also retaining people. Um, and then I also tried to really, I kept my question like pretty general. And then I tried to listen to the answers, like the companies that I felt less sure about were the ones that were just like, oh yeah, we we hire like, this and that like we hired this woman and like these races whereas like the people who like the companies that I felt like were really passionate about it um, usually it was like the recruiter they would get really excited about speaking about the issue and that was a big um, indicator for me that okay like this isn't this person is not just like spewing a laundry list of things that they're supposed to say but they're they actually care and they're really passionate and, and oftentimes they, without even me asking, would like share like the makeup of the company, the makeup of the team, 
um, say like, oh, there's like X people of color or X or like, oh, like we go to like pride together as a group or something like that. Um, and then I think so like those are the things that I looked for um, after like asking a fairly generic question. Thanks, Julie. Love that. Retention, obviously, so important, not just who we're hiring, but why are they staying if they're staying? Diana, would you add to that? Yeah, I'd absolutely add maybe questions around what uh, does your company do, do to celebrate different identity groups? Um, because they may not have a diversity team or diversity group, but they may do some Heritage Month celebrations or something like that. I'd also add that um, it's not just about asking your questions out loud, but also asking yourself some questions. So who's interviewing me? And what does the interview panel look like? Also, did they ask me any questions about any of my accessibility needs when they scheduled the interview? Um, you can also ask yourself, did they ask me for my pronouns at any point in this process? Because that's also an indication of, you know, where the company stands and how their um, DEI and B values kind of are ingrained in their processes. Love that. So much new information for me personally, but I'm learning and these are so helpful and tips that we'll take away and we'll we'll share with our clients and our candidates as well. Um, Matthew, anything that you'd like to add? I mean, yeah, I'm actually uh, interviewing for jobs right now, so that's fun. Um, it's been interesting because as a openly queer person, both in my resume, um, in my LinkedIn profile, my whole business is built around it, so employers have a sense of that. So um, one of the things that I ask them specifically always is, can you define um, how your company is defining diversity? Um, I, it's, it's always an interesting question to me because you're really going to get a sense of where the employer's at. Um, some employers are going to be at what I call like the visual diversity, right? So they're going to really focus around gender and race, for example. Um, other companies have moved more into disability, LGBTQ+, veteran, right? So you can get a good sense, too, of like what the company's uh, um, where they're currently at around those identities. So that one's been a really good one um, just to kind of measure that because I've had some employers who can speak really fluid to what the company as a whole is talking about. And then other recruiters can't speak as well to it, which just goes to show that it's either not a huge push in their organization um, or the recruiter themselves don't care. It's usually not the recruiter though. Um, so that's been a super helpful question. Thanks for sharing that. Before we uh, move on, anyone else? I know this was a was a big topic. We have a lot of get, we have a lot to get to, but um, so important. So many uh, tactical questions here. Anyone else before we move on? Okay, great. Um, what can candidates look for on a potential employer's digital profile, uh, their website, their social media, or more granularly? you know, overall just employer branding that you, that you see. I think that um, it's important to note, I'm, you know, there's so many companies out there that are very small, not diverse. They want to make this a priority. I, I'd like to hear like, you know, just some real tactical advice of what can they do today, tomorrow to push their company forward. And I'll start with, uh, with Matthew here. Sure. So I would say if you're if you're trying to put that foot forward around diversity, equity and inclusion, especially if you're a smaller company, um, one of the best ways to do that is getting involved in the community. Right. Two or three people in a smaller company going to volunteer at an LGBT center or mentoring students with disabilities or any of these different ways you can get involved with Chamber of Commerce, your local university or college. These are great ways to demonstrate your um desire to help these communities and it's not just lip service right um money also speaks really well so if you have a little funding to throw around always throw a little funding that way um like here at our career center we have a scholarship we have a place where people can donate professional clothing and all of those things build up goodwill and demonstrate a larger commitment to your fellow person um and so that's one of the main things for smaller companies that i tell them to focus on it's okay if you haven't gotten to the ability to hire more diverse representation, that will come as you start getting more into the communities themselves. I appreciate that too, because I think that, again, there's companies that wanna do this and they say, well, 
obviously time is, is a factor always, but getting involved in the community is something that can be pretty easy, you know, and something that companies can do potentially tomorrow or suggest organizations. Uh, Diana, what do you think? One of the things that I loved about Matthew's advice is that not only does it um, allow your organization to kind of get out and give back, but it's also a great way to expose your employees to a community that they may not be involved in. It's a great way to do some learning and development, especially if you don't have like a, a learning and development team that can teach unconscious bias or teach about privilege or something like that. They actually experience it through those um, through those events and the outreach things that you're doing. And so um, I loved that, that advice, Matt. Oh, thank you. So looking for, looking for ways, <laughs> looking for things that you can do to teach your employees and expose your employees while also kind of s- developing this brand for, for the company as well, that, that we care about the communities that we're in. We, um, we care about people who don't look like us, that kind of thing. So important. Um, And when it comes sticking to digital profiles and researching and before even maybe even getting in the interview process, um, what are some tools that candidates can use to research an employer's brand? How do you ensure there's authenticity there? Which I know can always be a question. I'll start with uh, Dalen and then move to Julie. Sure. Um, I think one of the there are, there are some 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 obvious answers about where you go to research a company's commitment, right? You can, other than looking at their their about us page or their careers page, which is where where if they post them, they usually put their values. But um, obviously, Glassdoor and LinkedIn are are two interesting places to look, though they both tend to be pretty limited windows. Glassdoor is like any referral marketplace that you're going to feel hear a lot more negative voices than positive ones. LinkedIn is an opportunity for companies to uh, put some of their strategies into action in terms of the ways that they talk publicly about DEI and B issues. Um, But I think there's a, some more ephemeral sort of less like, trusted tools, registered trademark kinds of things we can leverage in order to learn more about our potential employers. And it's the flip side of what Matthew and Diana were talking about, and that is our communities and our networking organizations. There's one of the most powerful reasons to develop a wide professional network is so that when you are considering an employer, you can reach out to that network and ask them, Do I know anybody that's worked here? What were your experiences? And if I don't know anybody, do I know somebody who knows somebody that has worked here and can talk directly about their experiences here? You can also go straight to the, the, uh, straight to the horse's mouth. You can find a person who works there and ask them out for coffee or virtual coffee, right? Just, most people are, if you hit them up on LinkedIn and tell them that you're interested in working here and you want to learn more about the experience, very few people are going to deny you that that half hour of their time. And most folks are going to be actually a little caught off guard and flattered that you reached out to them as a, uh, for that purpose. So, you know, while you can cobble together your own sort of DEI assessment from things like Glassdoor, LinkedIn, and About Us pages. You're going to get a much more candid view by talking to people who have direct exposure to that company and the ways in which they act or don't act their values. I think that's that's uh, very well put. LinkedIn networking, asking people directly who have worked there, who do work there. There shouldn't be anything to hide, right? Obviously, uh, it's interesting. In the last panel, we talked about references. We're seeing this to be obviously an employee's market. Give references of people that are working there. Give references of people that just started there or three, six months in. What's the training been like? What's the onboarding been like? Uh, Did the interview process, did they 
say what they were going to do in the onboarding and what it's going to be like? How has that changed? So I think transparency is key. Julie, anything to add there? Um, not really. Uh, those are all really good points. I also just wanted to highlight something that Matthew had mentioned earlier about how like about companies that volunteered together. And I think when when a company talks about like the activities or like or like the their like resources or conversations that they've had recently within within the team surrounding surrounding like any current events or any like like obstacles people have faced, I feel like those are always good indicators because um, people don't really want to go into in depth in something that they're not familiar. They don't really care about. So I think that's like when they do that, they're like, okay, these people care. Totally. It shows rather than saying it shows these action steps. Um, moving forward, how can employers, can I, drop a, can, I can I give a, a real quick suggestion? Sure, of course. Go for it. Um, Reddit is like the best tea ever. Whenever you're trying to learn more about a company, you can go into Reddit and find the, some of the best types of candid responses. Um, and I will say, if you're going to like Glassdoor, um, I love that Daniel brought that up. Be sure you do like control F because, you know, sometimes a lot of those inner, like those write-ups can be really long. So if you do control F, keyword search like discrimination, misogyny, um, all those good things. I also really recommend Google searching your company name that you're applying for and search lawsuit search discrimination, search LGBT, um, you'll see lawsuits probably come up for some of your companies. And those are things that you are, they're on the table to be, to be brought up to an employer if that's something you feel comfortable with. I've brought it up before. I didn't get the job, but it felt it was important to me to bring that up. So those are some things you can do as well to really help making sure that you're getting in granularly with employers. Um, and one piece that you can even notice with an employer as an LGBTQ plus person is ever since, um, you know, the um, Supreme Court ruled that sex underneath this um, sex um, non-discrimination policy, sexual orientation and gender identity fall under the term sex. So it's important though that employers actually spell out sexual orientation and gender identity because most students are not gonna know that sex falls underneath that because of some law, some people said somewhere, right? Um, so that's a really big way for you to demonstrate that LGBTQ plus inclusion by making sure you're spelling out those identities as well. Thanks for adding that. Uh, and sorry to, to cut you off there. No, you're all good. Believe me. I, hey, you know, I'm, I'm country, so I'll just like butt in just a little bit, but I'll be polite about it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we have so many great questions. I want to get to uh, to all of them and obviously, you know, save some time for the last 10 minutes. Um, so we'll zoom through and, and try to keep it, you know, concise and short. How can employers authentically share their journey uh, in DEIB? if they're just starting out in their process or early on too early to share KPIs, um, how do we encourage that transparency? And I'll just add like a, a question that I have in my mind is where do you go from it being a priority to it being a responsibility? Because I think a lot of companies have this as a priority, but not necessarily making it a responsibility. So a lot to unpack there. I'm going to start with, uh, with Julie. Um, I actually think I feel I, the other things that I said were more applicable to this question. Um, but yeah, just asking and listening for answers around like how, how, I don't know, I guess it's kind of a gut feeling. Like when you're talking to someone, um, how authentic do they seem? But yeah, I think for me, just generally trying to, trying to see like what, how enthusiastic someone is about speaking about the things that they do together. And I think like things that people do as a group. Um, Cause that's kind of like part of like, okay, now I can feel part of this team or part of this group. And we're working on like either like learning about something together or there's like some sort of like growth um, as, as a group where like you get to feel like you're not just an individual, but you're also like part of, part of this group. Thanks. Diana. I think that as a candidate, one thing that you can look for is the why. So similar to what you were saying, Natan, um, about it's not just a, a priority, it's a responsibility. And so one thing that I would encourage candidates to look for is any kind of statement about why this is important 
to the organization, why this is important to the leadership of the organization. And that's where people get really authentic um, when they talk about their why statement. I care about this because I grew up in a place that wasn't diverse, or I care about this because of this reason. And so if there are ways to look for why statements, you could even ask that in the interview process as one of your interview, one of the questions that you ask is so as asking the hiring manager, so what does diversity and inclusion mean to you? And why do you care about it? Why is it important on your team? And so I think even if there are no numbers and metrics to point to, then the person's personal kind of authentic story is really important as well. I think that if you're an employee at an organization, so once you have the job, one thing that you can listen for is these these stories about why. So, um, and, and especially from your leadership, you want to hear about this from the top down. You do not want to just be hearing about diversity from your ERGs or from, you know, the the one person diversity team or whatever about this. You want to hear from the top down. Why is this so important? You want to hear them talk about it regularly and not just in Black History Month or Pride Month. Um, and you want to hear them talk about kind of how they connect with allyship or why, how they connect with a certain identity. Because if we can't talk about this, if we can't share our stories, then I question how, how um, I question our commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion if we're not talking about it and we're not talking about how we personally connect to it. I love that. Uh, the why is so important. I saw a comment on the side uh, from Amy who was saying, you know, don't just say we're committed, talk about statements on goals, intentions, make it specific, add why this is important. Dalen or Matthew, anything to add there? I think for myself, something I would like to see that I don't ever have or haven't seen in the past um, is like, Every company is required to, or I think they're required anyway, to be gathering demographic statistics about their, their hires. What are they doing with that data? And why is that not published on their About Us page, right? Why can't they, in accompaniment with their goals around like, hey, we, we believe that we need to build a diverse workplace because, and here's where we're at. Right. That what a powerful statement that would be to say, here's where we're at and here's why we think it falls short. Here's some things we're doing to address that. So, you know, if the question is what can companies do to make stronger statements, I think that would be one. That's something I would like to see. Um, I'm not an HR specialist. I don't know if they're. Um, what what legal hurdles there are there. And I know that talking about race as a hiring manager and as an HR person is fraught, that there are some mixed signals that we get from where ethics and laws come, come, uh, come together. Um, but as from a pie in the sky kind of perspective, that's something I would certainly love to see. Thanks, Dalen. I, I appreciate that. Something that all companies could provide today. I mean, obviously, barring the legal HR implications, but uh, it's something that's. Natan, I can't hear you. Oh, can you hear me? Can you hear me okay? Oh, did mine go out? Great. <laughs> log back in, log out, and log back in there. Uh, we'll come back. Uh, just moving ahead. One of the most one of the most pressing topics right now that I think is really interesting is is remote and how remote relates to the people that we recruit and the people that we retain. Um, what does a company's remote policy mean in terms of DEIB? Um, how does employee engagement in the remote world and building an inclusive environment change your strategy? And we'll start with uh, with Deanna here, and I'm so excited for this question. Yeah, so you're absolutely right. This is a topic everyone's talking about right now. And I think our remote policy is indicative of the I and the B and the D, E, I, and B. 
right? And sometimes even the E as well, but it's indicative of how we think about inclusion, inclusion of people in different life stages and life situations, but it's also inclusive or indicative of how, our, how we help people feel like they belong in this organization. And so for example, if I am a parent and my organization doesn't have um, flexible work arrangements, that could communicate to me that my organization doesn't necessarily care that I'm a parent and doesn't see that as a value that I bring to the table, right? Um, and so that could limit my options at the company because I have kids to pick up from school or from after school programs or something like that. And so I may not feel like my experience is included if there are no good, strong kind of flexible work arrangements or remote policies and that can impact my feelings of belonging at an organization. And so I think that in this new world that we're looking at where companies are now starting to, to open up their flexible work arrangements, I think intentionality is the key here. In order to be, um, in order to encourage engagement, we have to be intentional about our policies. We have to be able to say, you can work from wherever you want, or you can work in a different, you know, you can start work early and leave, you know, earlier in the day or something like that. We have to be able to say things like that. We have to be able to give people the space to go and have therapy in the middle of the day or at, you know, at the end of the day or go back to school or something like that. And that shows to our employees that we care. And um, pl employees who feel like they care, they are cared for, they are supported, their whole selves are supported, they are going to be more loyal, more innovative. You are more likely to retain those employees because what's the point of getting in all of this diversity and hiring for diversity if you can't retain them because your policies um, are actually making them feel like they're not cared for. And so um, thank you for coming to my TED Talk. <laughs> but hopefully that kind of answers uh, answers that question. Yeah, I think that's that's obviously super important, giving people the flexibility. Uh, I want to touch, I want to ask Dalen though, but um, one thing maybe Dylan, you can cover as well is like when supply might be tight for people, does that make it? Does that make a difference? And people, you know, might not be in the Bay Area, might not be in New York, might not be in LA or the big cities. Does that impact your strategy or strategies that? Um, like I, I think ultimately, we. It comes down to a question of whether or not we believe that labor is a commodity, or that labor is a collection of human beings. And if we believe that labor is a commodity, then when we purchase labor, we're going to be a lot less flexible about how that labor shows up. If we believe that labor is a collection of human beings, if we believe that we are building a place where people can bring their whole selves to work, it follows then that that can only be true if we create the ability for people to bring their whole selves to work. And if work means nine to five in an office that people have to commute to, that doesn't involve all of our whole selves. It only involves some of them. And so as a leader, as a hiring manager, as someone who says, I want to build teams, where people can bring their whole selves to work. I don't get to say, and you have to be here. That's not allyship. Allyship is not words. Allyship is actions, right? And for a hiring manager, sometimes those actions mean getting more flexible about how people work, getting more flexible about where people work and getting more flexible about when people work. And if ultimately I believe that I am hiring responsible adults who are can be trusted to meet their commitments, then who the hell am I to say how they go about meeting those commitments? I hired them because I trust them to get the job done. And if that means they're going to get it done sitting in their living room, 
fantastic. If that means they're going to get it done sitting next to someone at a desk in a cube farm, that's fantastic too. I care about results. I don't care about the implementation. As long as the team delivers, as long as my people are happy, as long as people feel like they can show up in their best way, then my work is done. Thanks, Salen. Um, wow, that was great. That was so well said. Anyone else want to add here? Matthew or Julie? I'm good. I think that was spot on. <laughs> I'm good too. Okay, great. Um, this one, I'm jumping back to Matt, Matthew, um, for companies that are looking to recruit LGBTQ plus talent, there's often hesitation in disclosure of identity in the process. What are your thoughts about this? Yeah, so I mean, I work with students a lot, um, and it's a definitely a worry amongst queer students, um, especially with amongst Gen Z. You know, Gen Z is coming up, and they're really looking at gender and gender fluidity, gender queer, non-binary is becoming um, a much more common identity. So, um, I think it's a couple things. One, I push with Awesomely Authentic with all my heart to try to get employers to um, specifically look at queer people and to allow them to opt in to those questions that Daylene was talking about earlier, because if, if we're not being counted, we're never going to be a focus of recruitment. It's just the way it is, right? An employer can't say, oh, we should focus on queer people if there's no data that shows like retention or anything like that. Um, so for anyone who's looking into exploring that, um, I always really encourage my clients to check out Netflix's um, uh, United States postings and their website. It allows for so many different types of opting in of identity. It's really cool. It's an awesome way to also demonstrate that inclusion right off the bat to people about who you're seeing and you're allowing people to opt in. Um, I think the reason LGBTQ plus identities are still such a, an awkward identity to talk about in the workplace is because, you know, there are four generations currently in the workplace. I mean, you think back just to the 80s, um, late 70s, people were being arrested, right? So for being LGBTQ plus, their names were being printed in papers, they were being fired for it. Last summer is when we finally got protections, right? So I think it's because queer identities live in this space where we're supposed to be secret about it, right? Queer people have always been told to kind of be secret and stay in the corner. And I will even say with my interviews, I am unapologetically queer in my interviews. Like I say, girl, I snap my fingers. I don't try to like masculinize myself the way I used to because I don't wanna do that anymore. I wanna be my full queer self. So so in those spaces, allowing for employers to use their pronouns when they're first introducing themselves is a great way to demonstrate that inclusion. Working with LGBT centers, specifically centers that work with LGBTQ plus youth and LGBTQ plus youth of color um, is really important, especially trans youth of color. Um, these are all really important ways that employers can get involved to help the queer community. And while I do love a rainbow and I love the rainbow logos, it has to be a lot more than that. Um, so if there are any employers on the call right now, a few things for queer people that we're looking at when it looks at LGBTQ plus identities. One, is your company donating to um, anti-LGBTQ plus legislation? Um, students, we are teaching students to look those things up and how they look those things up. We also teach our students about looking you up on the HRC Equality Index, but taking that with a grain of salt because it is self-reported. Um, so we really encourage students to look at like the top 50, for example, um, Diversity Inc's top 50, they tend to do a little better. Um, and something else I would really encourage employers to do, um, and as they're kind of thinking about um, LGBTQ plus inclusion, is we really also, like similar to veterans and disability, we run the gamut of identities, right? So you want to support not only um, in your diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts, um, things around race and gender, but also you want to make sure you're helping those um, identities that maybe are not discussed as much, like LGBTQ plus disability, because people have intersectionality. We have 
multiple identities. And if you drop the ball on one, there goes all that work you just did on the other. <laughs> so making sure it's a holistic approach is really the best way to go about it. And um, queer people are everywhere. It's going to be more and more and more, especially around gender. So definitely gender and Gen Z, prepare for it. It's coming. And if you're not on board, you're going to get left with not the best talent sometimes. <laughs> Wow, thanks, Matthew. Um, if you, if possible, maybe you could drop some of those uh, URLs or whatever that you have in the chat for everyone. So you, you gave us so much good information. I'm writing as much down as I can, but um, whatever you can share, that would be super helpful. Uh, Julie, oh. Dalen, Diana, anything to add there? Just that I totally want to be a member of Gen Dur. That sounds amazing. Uh, you know, I, I uh, one of the things that came up for me as, as you were talking, Matthew, is that like for a lot of queer people, they they have that benefit of, of choosing whether or not they want to disclose. Right. Whereas for myself, for example, I, I don't get to choose my transness. It's here. Like you don't. I don't get to hide that anymore. My body is, impo it's impossible to hide my transness at this point. And so it, it has become a really interesting litmus test for me to understand, like, how do people act when I enter the room? And how do people interact with me when I ask their pronouns? And how do people interact with me uh, when I talk about being trans and, and my experience of transness in the workplace? So it's always becomes a really interesting way of of, of vetting, vetting an employer. Thank you for sharing that. Appreciate that. Um, I'm just looking at time. We have 15, just for the speakers. If we go 15, minute, oh, 15 minutes over, is that okay? Is that possible to share a few extra minutes? Julie, Diana. Okay, great. All right, so hopefully we can stay on. There's so many great questions here and so much to share. Um, it's clearly important uh, of who is in the interview process. I think you've all brought that up. Um, how, can, um, how can companies engage employees in their process, already employees that are not candidates, but employees that have signed on and that are working there without tokenizing them? without going and saying, hey, um, you know, you're a person of color, can you be on this interview panel? Or, you know, hey, asking that same woman over and over. Or maybe there isn't someone from a diverse background, they don't have that person on there. Um, is there maybe someone from the outside they can add in? Any thoughts there? Uh, we'll start with Diana. Yeah, so I'll back up and I'll say that one of the practices that you can use to show that diversity is important to us and also to help candidates uh, see themselves at your company is to have a diverse interview panel. Um, so that's kind of where this issue can come up, though, is if I if, if this is a tech organization and we are predominantly men and we're constantly asking the one woman on the team to interview, like that's going to be one, you know, that woman starts to, to feel like the token, she probably already feels like that. Um, but two, it can be exhausting for that person. And so that can't be the only way that we show candidates that we care about diversity. And so that's when I start, I would start thinking about other ways. So to your point, Natan, I would say, Let's identify the allies on the team, the people who are really great about talking. They, they love diversity and inclusion and belonging, and they're great about talking about it. Um, maybe they can sit on the interview panel as well. Maybe you work, you know, into the discussion uh, just like you would, you know, a time to talk about the actual job. Let's work into the interview a time to talk about how our company views diversity and inclusion and belonging. So even if the token woman isn't there, the message still gets across to your to your candidate. Um, and maybe what you do is, instead of having the token woman there is maybe you offer the candidate 
is there any, would you, do you have any other questions that we, you don't feel like we can answer? We on this panel can answer. Could we set you up to talk to someone else at the company so that you can ask the questions that maybe you don't feel comfortable asking us? Um, so maybe that's another thing that you can do to kind of avoid that tokenism. And then I think for the person who might feel like they were the token one, maybe one of the things that you do is you explain, I'm not just <laughs> inviting you to be on this panel because you're the, the one black person on the team, but we also find other, because to Matthew's point from earlier, we are all different identities, right? I am a black woman. I'm a straight black woman. I'm a married black woman from California, you know, and so th there's this sense of intersectionality. And so I'm not just inviting you to be on this interview panel because you are black. I'm inviting you because you're also really good at this thing. You're really good at um, finding, seeing things that other people can't see in, in talent and in potential talent. And so there's another, there's another piece of this is, you know, explaining to everyone who's on the panel why they're there. And being black or being a woman or being the, the minority can't be the only reason. Thank you. Yeah, so many good notes there. Um, something that I took away is being proactive in the time, maybe even being transparent with the candidate of saying, hey, on this day at this time, we're going to be talking about D, E, I, and B. Um, anyone want to add there, Matthew, Julie, Dalen? I don't think I'd want to follow that, that up. That was too good an answer. That was great. Um, yeah, that was fantastic. When we are looking at employer KPIs, something that a lot of companies don't have, um, what are some tactical, again, maybe today KPIs that a company can share uh, that demonstrates the commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, where would you share those? What are candidates looking for? Um, obviously, usually the bigger the organization, the more resources they can dedicate here. But I'm just thinking of organizations at all sizes. We'll start with Julie, maybe even some questions you look for, any measurements you look for. Sorry, trying to get off mute. Um, I don't know about like concrete stuff, I guess. Um, I know like my company right now is really small. So they, I feel like there's not like a lot of active um, like ways to measure, but I am, I think like one thing that I've noticed in specific environments is like how people behave when I guess like kind of like connecting it to the previous question, like when people aren't, when the token, like, like for me, like if, when I'm as a, usually the only Asian woman engineer, like how do the men behave when I'm not there? Um, I think like being conscious of that and like demonstrating, like being okay with like calling people out, um, sign like things like that have, I think are important because sometimes like you, you find out that, Oh, like so-and-so like did this and it was really great, even though like I wasn't there or um, sometimes the opposite can be true. Like, Oh, the environment changes when specific people are there. So um, yeah, I think in terms of like when, when you like see how genuine people are um, I think a big indicator is like how, how, how are they behaving when the person that is like different isn't there yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, hopefully people are always saying good things, but if they're not, uh, how do we evaluate that? What are they saying? What's the feedback loop? Are people getting called out? Is there accountability there? Matthew, would you add anything? Yeah, I mean, I would say 
where's your money going, right? Is it going to um, top tier universities that don't need the money? Or is it going to help um, underserved communities around you, around your um, HQs or um, even your nonprofits like, you know, the Trevor Project or, you know, um, HRC Foundation? Of course, I know a lot of queer stuff because that's my world. But um, <laughs> Giving money to those spaces are great, but think about your inner circle and right around you and how you can help give funding to a local LGBT student org to go to a conference, right? Those are things that make meaningful impact and create um, a positive brand awareness with your company right away because that's how most students are going to find out about you as a company is through other positive types of experiences. Um, so that's one good K KPI to share. Um, I also think another good KPI to share really is just um, looking at where you were maybe two years ago, right? Sharing those little wins is a big part of it as well. I think never trying to gloss over like we're amazing and super inclusive. Um, if you're struggling, be honest about it. Um, students nowadays, uh, can, they are looking for authenticity so much. They will deep dive. They will dig. They will find information of what makes them feel most comfortable. Um, so if you're sharing that information authentically, I would really recommend it. Recommend going through a university career center, showing it on your social media. Those are great ways to do that. And set yourself KPIs that are achievable. Like we're all using probably Instagram, right? Or some form of social media. Every time you have a person highlighted or someone's in the picture, put their gender pronouns beside their name. That's a great way to signify to a lot of people, oh, they are at least aware of gender identity, right? And usually if you're aware of gender identity, it means that you are a little more on the DEI side because um, queer people are down there with a lot of other identities that just don't get seen as much, right? So that's a really great KPI. Um, just be honest with it. And, you know, I think utilizing the resources you have around you. Um, one other KPI I would say is I love ERGs, employee resource groups, affinity groups, DEI committees. You need to be paying those people for that information for that work. You need to be giving them some sort of compensation. They are doing a lot of times for the love of DEI, um, but they also have another job on top of that, right? What they were hired to do. So make sure you're giving them some sort of compensation um, because that's really, really ideal and it helps prevent some of that burnout as well. So measure that. <laughs> Great points. Um, key takeaways. And just going back to the pronouns, that's something that companies can do today. They can add that to their Zoom. They can add that to their website. They can have. They can ask people to put that on their LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. um, at least that shows more awareness. Uh, Taylin, Dion, anything to add there? Dion, we have a question. I'm, I'm merging everything, but on uh, BuzzFeed's commitment to DEI and just that strategy, if you want to tackle that here as well. Sure. So I'll kind of merge it with the the last question. So one of the things BuzzFeed does, and I'm a big fan of, if companies have this data is to share and make make your diversity data public. Um, not just diversity, honestly, and make your inclusion information public too. Like what do you do to ensure that em employees feel included as well? Um, when we did, when BuzzFeed published their diversity data last year, one of the things that was also important to me is that we shared and this is what we're going to do next. So here are the facts, here are the numbers, but now here's what we're focused on, or here's how we're gonna continue to increase or continue to um, to maintain, you know, whatever metrics we were looking at. Um, in addition to that, totally agree with Matthew. Um, at BuzzFeed, we believe that um, labor should not be invisible, that, um, that the people who are doing this work um, should not be doing it as a side gig um, and not be getting not be getting um, recognized for it. And so we pay our ERG leads, we pay our diversity council members for that work um, it, because we believe that that is a best practice. That's how you show your commitment to this as well is putting your dollars behind it. Um, one of the things that that BuzzFeed does that the companies could do depending on you know how you're set up and what your what your website looks like um, that we don't necessarily talk about a lot or people don't know about externally a lot is pro bono work. 
So BuzzFeed is a fairly small company. And so and smaller companies may not be able to shell out a million dollars to give to such and such nonprofit organization. But we have a platform called BuzzFeed.com um, and we have ads on that platform. And so we will partner with different nonprofits and just give away ad space. Um, which is to us sometimes the same as giving away money because we could have used that ad space, you know, to sell an actual ad. Um, but that's another thing um, to be looking out for too. Sometimes an organization with a website like that is actually using their their space to give voice to amplify a certain issue or a certain or a certain group, and that's something that that's important to to BuzzFeed as well. So hopefully that answers the the question around BuzzFeed strategy. Yeah, I no, can go I, way into in more detail, but I'm sure we don't have time for that. No, I appreciate that. Um, and I think that's another good uh, suggestion, which is, okay, obviously there's potential for cash. Obviously there's potential for, you know, more ownership, but what can you give away that, you know, maybe doesn't cost money? Something that I've also seen companies that we try to do is highlight uh, organizations that are prioritizing DEI and, and B um, or nonprofits or, or helping underserved communities on our social media or on their social media and just say, hey, you know, shouting out, here's how you can get involved. Here's how you can donate. Here are the people we like. That additional spotlight is so big for so many of these organizations, which are having a big impact um, on these communities. And again, something that doesn't really cost any money and really much time. Uh, Dalen, would you add anything there? I, I think I would only just sort of uh, build on what you just said, Natan, which is uh, that like if your allyship does not involve sacrifice, if your allyship costs you nothing, it's not allyship. Right? You must give away something in order to contribute to this work. Maybe it's time, maybe it's money, maybe it's ad space, but it has to cost you something or you are giving up nothing in order to make room at the table. You cannot make room at the table until you have cleared some space at the table to really abuse the metaphor. But uh, allyship without sacrifice is performative and useless. And when you say time there, uh, just to be specific, does that does that mean you know volunteering? Does that mean thinking, working on it? What do, what does that mean to you? Maybe it means volunteering. Maybe it means uh, attending workshops. Maybe it means uh, taking time out to listen to people's stories. Maybe it means reading a book. It might mean any number of things. But if your allyship is nothing more than putting a black square on your avatar on LinkedIn, well, that didn't really cost you anything, did it? That's performative. If you just threw out a rainbow logo and nothing else for Pride Month, that's pretty performative and ineffectual. All it tells me is that you have a marketing department that's doing its job. So like until, until you have sacrificed something, you don't get to call yourself an ally. Until your company has sacrificed something, they don't get to say that they are invested in DEI and B. Like this isn't something they just get for free by saying it, by talking about it. I want company. you to be my friend. <laughs> I adore you. <laughs> what did you say, Matt? Matthew? I said I want you to. I said I want Daylene to be my best friend because it's true. It's true. And what's so funny? This Pride Month, so many younger queer kids were calling out corporations. Um, they would like post these funny memes of like a party that just like went way down the tubes, and it would say something like when a. Um, 
homophobic co company tries to celebrate pride and it's just like a horrible gift of like the worst party you've ever been to in the world, people are very aware of it. And I think Daylene speaks so well to that is that people want to show, they want receipts, show us receipts of what you've done and then we can have more discussions. So I just love everything that you just said. Well, it's fantastic. Uh, and as AJ just put in, ally is a noun and a verb. Show the work, which I think is uh, is really powerful. Um, we will get to the questions in just a second. I know we're already over time, but I did want to um, just highlight one area, which was the last question. Talking to leaders today, um, and there's some leaders in here. Um, what advice do you have for them? And I, we've gotten so much good advice, but I, I want to hear like one thing from each of you, if you could talk to the CEO of every company uh, and I'm one of them and I want to hear um, what's one thing that they can do today to embed DEI in their, in their culture. Um, and we'll start with uh, Diana moving down to Dalen, Julie, Matthew, and then we'll take one or two questions. Yeah. Um, just one. <laughs> um I said this earlier, but create a, create a culture where people can talk about it, can talk about your commitment to DEI. And you do that as the leader by talking about it yourself and talking about why it's important to you and talking about how it's embedded in the strategy of the business and how we lead with diversity. It's diversity first. You know, uh, as the as the CEO, you set the tone. and so in order to set the tone that this is a value for the company, just like anything else, we have to, we have to talk about it. It has to be everywhere. And, um, and you have to, you have to get involved. It can't just be, you push it off to your, your chief diversity officer to talk about it or do the work. You actually have to get involved. And so um, that's one of the things that I, that I appreciate about our CEO is that he talks about it. He talks about, um, growing up in Oakland, California, and he talks about how, um, you know, he gives us the space to, he, he's allowed our global all hands to be turned over just to talk about diversity, you know, and I'm always speaking about it. And he, he, incur he intended unconscious bias training when we told the entire company you were doing it. And then once he signed up, he said, I signed up, you all do it too. And so, as a CEO, you set the tone. And so you have to be talking about it constantly and making it a part of the culture. Thank you. Uh, talking about the why, the strategy coming from the top down, that's what we're talking about, but creating the space to be able to talk about this. And, and one thing that I obviously hope to encourage is also hearing disagreement and people feeling potentially uncomfortable because that's usually how we kind of take steps forward and grow inside and out. Dalen, what, what would you say there? One thing uh, to leaders to embed DEIB in their, in their processes and culture. It's not enough to hire individual contributors that represent diversity. If your entire leadership team is all straight white cisgender men, you will not build, you will not attract, you will not create a diverse culture. So if you want diversity, don't start at the bottom, start at the top. Build a leadership team that reflects your values. And if you say that your values are creating opportunity for historically excluded di demographics, if you say that your values are to create a diverse culture, and all of your managers are not representative of that, then you really need to examine whether or not your words are reflecting your actual feelings or if they're just words. Thank you. I don't know that it's a candidate problem. It's not a pipeline problem. It's a hiring problem. And if your leadership team does not reflect the diversity that you want your organization to have, then you have hired poorly. The top needs to reflect the values. Well, well said, Julie. 
Um, I would say make learning a big part of the process and try to learn in like multiple different ways, whether it's conversation, reading, watching things, but like find multiple ways to learn. And also like keep in mind, like, like the one token woman or the one token person that you've spoken to, they don't represent everyone of that gender or race or, or um, sexual identity. Like they don't represent just one person. So like in your learning process also meet with m- many different people and just keep in mind, like, yes, we can have the same background and have a different experience or a different and agree and disagree on different things. So like try to stay away from tokenizing too. Learning uh, different ways, learning in different ways and uh, staying away from tokenizing, I think is well said. Matthew, what would you say? Okay. Can everyone hear me? I lost volume again, so I can't hear anybody again, but you can hear me and that's the important part. Uh, (laughs) So um, for DEI, my main concern when I've worked with clients, um, there's this idea that DEI should be scary and um, taboo and everyone should, as my mama would say, get a tight butthole and hang on. Um, that should not be what DI is. I go in and I want DI to be fun. We're learning about not only other identities, but also what identities you hold. Um, so making DEI fun, engaging is really an important part. Never force anyone to any DEI training. It will blow up in your face. Multiple people have demonstrated that through research. And I would also really recommend just um, think of think of the best way of um, engaging your employees in identity talk that maybe they've never experienced before. Like I use drag queens a lot in mine and queer performers to kind of engage in that talk. So that's a really great way for you to kind of um, engage in those types of DEI strategies um, and having that information and those decisions being made with top executives so they can understand um, these identities as well. And that it's not just like little ants running around, like, you know, figuring out life. So that's what I would definitely encourage. Thank you. That made me laugh. Um, But fair points on um, fear, scariness, taboo. Uh, These are all things that I think a lot of leaders might think and that I have heard. Um, and how do we make it more accessible and more engaging, fun, learning, growing? Um, the last one, I, I did want to get to one question, which I saw, um, which was on getting employees to, to speak up if they do feel like the uh, the token employee. I thought that was very relevant because there's probably some people listening that do feel like that. And any advice that, that they can uh, use today? on how to speak up or how to get their company to use better practices. Does anyone want to take that? Sure. Like, um, ultimately it starts with a conversation with your manager and because ultimately, ideally they should be your ally in, in navigating your work experience. If you have that conversation with them and they're not receptive to it or they don't demonstrate that they have your back, you've learned something incredibly valuable about what you can expect during your continued tenure at this employer, right? And that gives you some really solid information about evaluating whether or not you want to continue being an employee there. It is a seller's market right now. And as providers of labor, we are the sellers. You don't have to put up with that crap. And like, if you can't get your manager enrolled in the recognition and embracing of your whole self, if you can't get your HR partners to support you in a more validating and less devaluing work experience, you really need to ask yourself whether or not that job is worth keeping for you. So well said, um, and I, I really appreciated yours and everyone's transparency here. And obviously that's what we're looking for in the panel, but uh, so well said, so much passion and, um, and so much tactical advice here um, for everyone. And 
LinkedIn's on the right side for anyone that wants to reach out. I'm sure the panelists would love to hear from you. Any questions? Julie, Deanna, anything else before we go? The only thing I was just going to add is that um, going back to your point about fear is that so much. Um, can you still hear me? I'm getting an error message. Okay, cool. So, um, so many people don't dive into this work or this these conversations, real, true conversations around their experiences, um, is because they're afraid to mess up and cancel culture. And so I think it's really important that organizations create these safe spaces where people can learn. They learn how to apologize when they do mess up, but they also learn and get educated on the, in the places where they need to get educated. And so um, that's something that's really important to me. Um, and so if there are any other leaders out there, like create these safe spaces for people. Accountability. So, so, so important. Uh, one of the best tools to do that is with All Voices, providing that feedback and other tools like All Voices. And um, I'm really grateful to everyone that joined. I'm really, really grateful to all of our panelists. They're all amazing. Um, I learned so much. And let's keep improving here. Let's keep uh, moving forward. The world needs us. So thank you all so much. I really, really, really appreciate it. Hope everyone has a great day, great week. Um, and there'll be a recording out, uh, I believe in the next week. So thanks so much. Have a good rest of your day. Thanks for staying over everyone as well. Thanks for having us.